Okay, hi everyone. So from the beautifully reconstructed material to the fictional. The project I'm going to talk about today comes out of efforts to map literary texts which trouble the boundary between the Euclidean space of the empirical world and the imaginary spaces of fictional worlds. Scholarship in literary GIS and the spatial humanities has long been engaged by this problem, of course, but time and again, GIS technologies prove themselves somewhat ill-equipped to address it. The fundamental challenge, which is obvious to anyone who's ever tried to map a literary text, lies in the fact that most literary texts, even ones squarely anchored in realism, shift between the real world and the fictional world, with the line dividing the real from the fictional not always being clear, and often being further blurred if the text is at some historical remove from the reader, meaning that there are points where it becomes impossible to anchor the text to the spatial coordinates a GAS requires. This mismatch doesn't mean the endeavour is pointless, however. There is some analytical utility to be had. And there's some honourable exceptions in the area of literary GIS. I've heard a few at this conference so far, um, but I have put two of my favourites on the slide. So the first one um, is Ian Gregory and David Cooper's emotion mapping in which they coded passages from the travel writings of the poets Gray and Coleridge. Um, they produced maps showing how these two poets kind of gave emotional or affective loadings to the landscapes of the Lake District. And the one on the other side there is Alex Christie and Katie Tanagawa's Z-axis project. So they, um, they took these maps of Paris and they uh, distorted the 2D plane according to where characters spend more time. So that map of Paris there with its bulges shows the places that are mentioned most often in Julia Barnes' novel Nightwood. Somewhat less thoughtful than these projects, though, are those that generate point maps from texts and then expect that to be the end of the story. So you mapped Bloom's journey around uh, Dublin. So you mapped Mrs. Dalloway's walk around London. So what? You have a shiny map, but what analytical insights are made possible by that mapping? So here in this paper, I want to suggest some other ways that we might think outside that literary GIS box, by presenting an approach which, while still attempting to leverage the power of digital tools and information visualization, does not collapse the real and the imaginary in its presentation of spatiality and does not elide one of the very qualities that makes literary space so interesting, the fact that it is something other than positivistic Euclidean space. This seems to me all the more important as generative AI now makes the work of geoparsing and producing point maps trivial. We are about to be overrun with maps, probably bad maps with hallucinations of literary texts. So we need to think critically about what we're doing when we move from a text to a map and back again and keep hold of the epistemological value of doing so. So to illustrate what I mean, let's begin with a poem by Dickinson. I chose Dickinson as the focus for this study, as her poems, if you know them, you'll know they're almost completely unmappable in any conventional cartographic way, given that they are largely devoid of specific geographical references while being preoccupied with literal and metaphorical space and suffused with a vocabulary of scales, sizes, and spatial contrasts. Here's one which, in its eight short lines, involves the reader in vertiginous shifts of scale and perspective. Yet, in place of precise designations of size or spatial relations, the poem marshals images, columns which close, the dip of bell, circumference, resonant and mysterious, as it's never quite clear what these things denote. There are suggestive words that imply movement of various sorts, stitched, reversed, slid, touched, went out. But are these shifts physical, conceptual, epistemological, or some combination of all three? The poem also keeps in play the sense of striking spatial contrast by its repeated invocations of I in contrast to these other larger elements. And this poem always seems the more remarkable to me because Dickinson wrote it in the 19th century, long before those first images of the earth from space um, that uh, started to become public in the mid-1940s. So the image on the screen is Earthrise from 1968. Um, and this image is sometimes said to have launched the environmental movement. And I wonder if Dickinson's poem is doing something of that same kind of conceptual work, capturing the utter insignificance of the size of a human in comparison with the universe, and yet insisting on human subjectivity of experiencing that shift as a human. So a poem like this catches the digital humanist in one of the prevailing paradoxes of literary mapping. The poem tempts you to map it, while at the same time resisting that mapping. 
the special metaphors, circumference, the dip of bell, are successful uh, poetic images precisely because they suggest mappable entities, perhaps the horizon. And while suggesting them, they also exceed them. Beyond the dip of bell might be the curved line projected onto 2D space that is the line one travels across a globe, say from one point out to the horizon, but it might also be moving beyond the place beyond which sound can travel through air or escaping the Earth's gravitational pull. The poem is useful for encapsulating in its eight lines what may be less obvious in mapping a genre that seems more firmly anchored to the material world, such as a realist novel, which also makes use, of course, of the polysemic nature of images and language, but tends to provide more readily mappable points along the way. Now, not all of Dickinson's poems are so grand in their existential scope, but once you are alert to these kinds of shifts and the fixation on scale, you begin to see them everywhere. No less venerable a critic than Helen Vendler uses a quantitative vocabulary of maps, grids, plots, and scales to describe the reach of what she calls the poetic templates that Dickinson uses. And I won't read the whole quote there, um, but uh, Vendler goes on to say, this list could be continued. These ingredients, taken one by one, are mainstays of lyric. But what disorients Dickinson's reader is the way that the poet maps these templates or grids one upon another, enabling her to leap from plane to plane. And that's a description that even sounds like a GIS, the juxtaposing of different layers of information, one on top of the other, so as to enable a reader or a viewer to leap from plane to plane and to make connections between them. So when I came across this quote, I felt like she was almost kind of giving her critical imprimatur of approval to my attempt to, to do this perhaps misguided mapping of Dickinson's poetry. But this point about the leaps is a crucial one. The poetry doesn't simply set these scales up and present them to us. It shifts. It leads the reader's imagination to shift between them. This dynamism of scale is, in other words, a crucial part of how the poem does its work of multiplying meanings, which do not stop at the spatial or the geographical. That, that poem on the previous slide, Vendler reads, as a meditation on being shut out of heaven and a rejection of religion, which, if you know Dickinson's work, you'll know is a thematic thread that goes through her whole oeuvre. Visualisation and conceptual mapping cannot capture the full significance of Dickinson's use of spatialization and cannot take into account all these templates that Vendler identifies. So you need to understand the results in tandem with the other things like the temporal scales, the cultural plot, the myth, and so forth. But what I'm suggesting here is that visualizations of this sort that deliberately eschew the positivistic anchoring to the real world mandated by a GIS can draw out attention to the elements of the poems that may not have been so clear and also offer us a framework for understanding relationships between different poems that may not be obvious. Okay, so that's the setup. Let me quickly explain my methodology. Okay, so I started uh, by establishing a scale fairly simple, just started at kind of human level in meters, um, went up and down, larger and small, on a log scale. So it's over two slides for legibility. So we start with human size, we move down the scale all the way to protons, and in the end I don't think I found anything smaller than an atom in Dickinson's work. So you've got some phrases there, um, the ones in quotation marks are examples of words or phrases from her poems that represent a particular point on the scale. And then, going up the scale, we move from towns and seas up to much less easily measured things like the firmament and the heavens. So the universe is, of course, much bigger than 10 to the power of 15 metres, but had I put in an even remotely accurate number, this would have made it impossible to see the variation at lower levels. So kind of we can understand that highest category as roughly denoting the largest thing the poems ask the reader to imagine. So there's many quibble, quibbles that one might raise here. Towns, seas, mountains can be both bigger and smaller than where I've put them here. But part of the challenge is that this kind of productively constraining exercise of taking something like, say, a star and pinning it down to a specific size is that it really makes you pay attention, as an interpreter of poetry, to the relationship between entities from whose perspective you might be asked to be seeing a star. Is the poem seeking to convey something of immense size, like the sun? Or is the focus on its tiny speck of light in the sky? Is it the distance from the earth? So it's less the specific coding decisions that are the interesting thing here, and more the act of attempting to capture what Bendler calls the leaps, the shifts between scales, as part of interpreting the whole poem. 
Okay, so once I had my scale, then I simply went off and read several volumes of Dickinson's to identify manual leave poems which dealt with space and scale and which had kind of enough of those things in them to be specially plotted. And I started with some of the poems that I already knew that would kind of fit well with this. Um, <clears throat> and I kept track of recurring words with special connotations and using those to identify other less well-known poems. And I will return to this list of words later. But for now, let's look at how the spatial plotting works. So here's an example. So I coded each line in the poem for size, and that let me plot a curve with the resulting points. And I was following the principle that if there was a line that didn't have an obvious size, then I just kept the score from the previous line. So in the third line of this poem, you see there is a reference to vast as destiny, but as destiny, <coughs> destiny isn't a clear entity that can be sized, I simply kept that at minus one. And that means that the shape of this plot doesn't actually capture the shift that's there semantically from vast destiny to trivial life, though had I made some alternative interpretive decisions, I could have chosen to capture that. Where it was possible to give a plausible size to a metaphor or an elusive word within the context of the poem's broader message, I did so. So the term physiognomy in line eight is an example of this. The poem employs a word which isn't human, and it actually could be an animal as well, but consider that whether it's animal or physical uh, corporeality, it's still something that is likely to be measured in meters. Um, so that's how I coded it. And this is also a useful example for illustrating the ambiguity that arises with references to things like the sun. Is that word sun there in line 10 serving to remind us of the giant size of the star at the center of our solar system? Or is it a reference to sunlight and its evaporating effects, which do not really have a size? I opted, and you may disagree, to give the word sun a size rating higher than day and sea, based on the contrast that the poem is structured around between the drop of dew and the things it interacts with and is eventually dwarfed by. Also notice that grammatically, the drop of dew is missing from the final paragraph, so that's a further signal, informed by close reading, that there's justification for not <coughs> swooping back down to the size of the drop of dew. <coughs> okay, so I did this process with 30 poems, so I wound up with 30 plots. Um, you can see there's some variety there, but there are some shapes that recur, and I'll get back to those in a bit. Let's look at a few examples to see what the analytical gains are from doing this kind of deformation and how visualizing the shifts might add an extra interpretive layer to the poem. So here's one. I started early, took my dog. It has a periodic motion that echoes the back and forth of the waves coming up the shore. So it's not that this graph necessarily tells us something that is inaccessible by human reading. Rather, the graph draws attention to an aspect of the poem that we may not have noticed. The first thing that hit me when I read this poem is the way that sexual violence is represented and indeed aestheticized. And I'm sure that's what my students would notice as well. So the graph is a productive constraint which might direct our attention elsewhere. This one, bustle in a house. This one has a clean swoop up at the end to the infinite, which we could read as evoking the soul leaving earth. So it kind of puts that bustle in the house into perspective. And a similar thing is going on with the brain is wider than the sky. There it is. Um, though here, the contrast is repeatedly made as the poem swings back and forth between human consciousness and the natural world. So I did this for a bit, and then I wondered whether there was any utility to be had from considering the similarity between graphs. So with so few words, it's really not viable to attempt to cluster this small corpus of poems on the basis of its words. But what about spatialized shapes? So to do this, I did a small experiment with the PixPlot packaged developed by Yale DH. So PixPlot identified four, which is normally used with like literally thousands of images, so this is a very tiny instance of it. Um, it, it identified four clusters and put 20 of the 30 images into one of those clusters. So um, here's some of what it came up with. So this cluster, which I've called cluster four, um, poems that have only one swoop. And if you read them and interpret them, you can see they've got a clear contrast between two poles. So when I looked back at the poems, I found those contrasts moving between things like love and pain, or activity and loneliness. Uh, the selfless servitude of a wife versus a woman's real inner self, and hope versus the extremities of endurance. 
Another cluster had multiple swoops, so these were a little bit less clear and clean with their opposition. Um, these were poems that were more likely to be ex uh, exploring an extended metaphor or looking at something from different perspectives. Okay, this cluster had something of a cleaner swoop profile, and I think what the cluster analysis is picking up on is the presence here of like some peaks and then some half peaks. And these are also poems focused on contrasts, which I've kind of reduced down to the known versus the unknown. And finally, five poems with more irregular oscillations, which were more likely to be structured not around contrast, but um, to be structured as a narrative and to not necessarily have a clear moment of crisis. So the numbers here obviously are too small to be conclusive about anything. So I put this approach of calculating similarity based on visual, visualizing spatial difference forward as a thought experiment that might have potential with a larger corpus. The process of interpreting these clusters reminded me of interpreting a topic model where it's very hard to not kind of look for patterns and connections and construct meanings from them. This might be a controversial approach for topic modeling, but it is a well accepted one for poetry. And what seems to me valuable about these plots is that they open up an alternative lens for the reader, capturing something different to what literary critics normally attend to. Things like thematic preoccupations, plot development, narrative perspective, the workings of metaphor. It provides, in other words, an alternative lens. It also offers a way to bring together poems that may not appear to share thematic preoccupations. And this seems to me one of the core imperatives for digital literary studies to use technologies to open up new analytical vistas on familiar objects of humanistic studies. If these graphs present a more diffuse, less anchored to the empirical world way of charting a poem's effects on the reader, this also seems important at a moment when genres like speculative fiction, Afrofuturism and so forth are emerging as key sites with which writers are articulating crises in multiple and imbricating areas, ecological, racial, social, techno-dystopian. The relationship between human beings and their environment uh, has been emerging over the last several decades as a particularly urgent focus for writers, which is all the more reason to look beyond the limitations of GIS as we seek to critically engage these new literary spatialities. So just one final experiment. I said I would return to this list of spatialized terms. And I wanted to see how these worked in terms of embeddings in historical corpora. So I took this, this list of terms to the Women Writers Project's Vector Toolkit. Okay, so here's an example of what happened if we take the vector for eternal and we do some vector mathematics on it and take away God. Um, so we've, we've taken something that normally connotes expansiveness in time rather than space. And then we take away the kind of religious sense, i.e. we kind of attempt to secularize its meanings, which is what Dickinson is doing in her poetry. This is what we get. So I tried this with two of the different corpora in the women writers. Um, on the left, you can see the results from the full women writers corpus. Um, and those results tend also to be time rather than space oriented. So words like endless, uninterrupted, lasting, not really a surprise. But on the right, which is the 19th century corpus, you begin to get some terms that do suggest space, heightened, deepening, unfathomed. And notice the presence of contractions here. So there's apostrophe signal that the words likely come from poetry, where the number of syllables and the stresses matters. So this suggests to me that there's some potentially interesting connections to be drawn between Dickinson's secularized use of terms so strongly associated with religious imagery, and perhaps a wider movement in the same direction in 19th century poetry. So a further example of the way that you might use this kind of approach to open up um, further research questions. So just to finish, there's obviously a great deal of subjective interpretation involved in the processes that I've set out here, from choosing the poems and deciding on the scale, to coding the poems for scale, interpreting the clusters. A Dickinson scholar would do it differently. In fact, a Dickinson scholar might well object strenuously to the very idea of pinning Dickinson down to numbers in the first place. Putting individual interpretive choices aside, I offer this as a provocation for literary studies to come up with alternative ways of understanding the workings of spatial and geographical workings in literary texts in ways that account for more nuance. The plots here are emphatically not explanations or indeed descriptions of what's going on in Dickinson's multifaceted works. Instead, like a close reading, they become yet another text to hold up against the poem 
and a way of generating new research questions around an author's use of space and scale. <laughs>